this is the best thing I've ever worked on by far. It's probably the best thing I've seen since Twin Peaks. I just think as a piece of work, as a drama, as a, as a thriller that pulls you in, it's really quite unique. My grandfather gave me a camera, right? And I was eight years old. It was, a, it was a Super 8 camera. It didn't have any film in it. I just carry this camera with me all the time. And I just really enjoyed, like, looking in this, looking at the world through this little square. And uh, we had this alleyway next door to the house. And I would just constantly be going up and down this alleyway, just holding this camera to my eye. And, and I think... Maybe that was somewhere, to a, to a certain extent, I started to learn subconsciously about composition at that point because I was doing it so many times that I became very aware of, you know, the, the, the closeness of the walls to each other and, and the, 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 the distance and how it would end up in the middle of this square. And a few years later when I started, when I actually got some film to put in the camera, and I started making these little films with my brother, they always ended up looking a bit like that. So I can't, uh, I'm not gonna give Kubrick any credit. The relationship that, uh, that I have with Alex Garland as, as, you know, in filmmaking terms is essentially based around this idea that we have a sort of understanding of what it is to, to really uh, collaborate as filmmakers. A highly, highly in intelligent man, fantastic writer, brilliant director, uh, always wants to un be able to understand every single element that goes into to making and telling this story. Yeah, I think what it boils down to is the idea that you pick the team to help you tell this story. Um, you pick the right people. I, I remember right from the early days, really, with, with, with Ex, Ex Machina. When I read that script, it was, it was like I was already watching the film. It, it gets straight to the point, but it's exciting, and it doesn't, there's no fat on it. A lot of scripts have a tendency to just over, over you know, over-describe stuff, and to, to really try and bring you into the world, and, uh, whereas this is just like, I don't know how he does it, but it's just in a, in a sentence you immediately understand where you are, what you're looking at, what this character is feeling, without ever being told any of those things. I think Rob does in his camera moves and lighting what Alex does in his writing um, and directing. Very considered, uh, lots of preparation. Um, and then he'll know, Alex will know fairly well how he wants to cover it. He doesn't storyboard like an Edgar Wright. There's, it's not all laid down, but he, he kind of knows what he wants, but he's very open to experimentation. I enjoy the concept of a sort of unflinching kind of proximity. And I think that stems from, you know, the movies that I grew up on as well. I always like to feel like I'm in the room, you know. In many ways, like the work that I would do with Alex, is that we have very, very similar um, aesthetic in that, in, that, in that sense. So, and, and also in particular for long takes. And that helps the idea of putting the audience in the room because there's something, we're not hiding anything, you know? We're not hiding in cuts. We're showing it as, as honestly as we can. versus deterministic. There are many ways you can frame something, but it's always, it's always the one that presents itself. Uh, it, it, for me, being, being the, the most obvious choice. So, for example, if we were, we'd block a scene, right? And then generally what would happen is, Alex and I will just take a moment before everyone else comes in, uh, with the actors still in the room, and we would just literally talk through it. We'd just say, okay, we're going to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And whilst, whilst Alex would be working with the actors, 
I can sit and watch and I can start to think about the best way in which we can tell the story in as, as in a fewer shots as possible, basically. So then when it comes to the framing itself, the less one thinks about it, the better it is. In other words, it's the first response, it's the one that, that presents itself. It, it, if there happens to be a sort of visual thread throughout that, then all for the better, but it's not, a, it's not an overly self-conscious decision. Um, there's always something aesthetically pleasing to me in finding a frame that tells the story, that gives, gives us proximity to the actor, but it never hides the, the environment that we're in. Uh, and if, if a frame can do those things, combine all of those things, uh, then great. Does anything ever happen without a reason? Yes. No. Things happen without a reason. Like? An example. Yes. A kid getting leukemia? Getting hit by lightning? It's an endless list. No. Lily. I didn't ask if things ever happened without a good reason. I said a reason. The leukemia was an aberration in the kid's DNA. The lightning was a static discharge. Why did the pen roll across the table? You pushed it. Why did I push it? I'm guessing to make a point. That's a reason. It's why the pen rolled across the table. We chose the right camera for this, for this production. Absolutely, no question. We chose the Venice because we knew through, through testing it was going to give us what we needed. What Alex says is like it's his job to essentially the way he sees it as far as our collaboration is concerned is is to create the content for me to film. So I needed I know that when I, I know that content is going to be incredible, right? And I have to be able to capture it in the best possible way I can. And and the Venice was the was the camera that was going to do that for us because through through testing in the test room, we knew it was the one that would that would work. In the case of Debs, similar to Ex Machina, it's, it's an extension of that world, if you like. We would be doing very long takes. In in a in this case, you know, another sort of self-contained set, uh, on albeit on a much much bigger scale, um, with a camera that was dance flooring its way around a room between two characters, or three characters in some cases. And what I ended up doing, rather than getting tangled up on a, on a dolly, and also because I had a second camera in there anyway, uh, is that we used this, this device, a really brilliant device called Stabilite. And it's a very, very small flight head. It was designed really for wire rigs and to, to hold a red camera, uh, but I, in the test room at Panavision, I, was, I said to the guys who designed this thing, really clever, amazing guys, um, can, we, can we get a Venice on here? So they tried to put a Venice on and the body itself was a little big and heavy and restrictive in terms of its pan and tilt. So I knew it was in the process and I remember saying that it would be amazing if we could have one of these for, for, for devs for this reason, to put the, uh, the version, the umbilical version, or i.e. the sensor with the lens onto the stabili. Uh, so that I could use it as a remote head, uh, so I could be outside of the room operating on the wheels with a monitor. I could have another monitor where I can see B camera. I'm on comms to Sam Phillips, who's the grip inside, push, pushing key, our key grip, moving the dolly around beautifully. Like I could talk him through the shot, react in a certain way, um, and we had the camera body strapped to the dolly, the umbilical sensor, C-series anamorphics on there. Beautiful, beautiful combination. It was a delight. And we used this like 
uh, on our dev set for a portion of the shoot, which was the six week portion of the shoot up in Manchester, every day we were using it, every day. Um, so it was a real bonus to be able to be in that position, um, to be able to s s keep the aesthetic of, you know, of, of our chosen camera, um, but have the ability to it, for it to adapt into a certain situation, which I thought was great. Following on from Annihilation, there was, like I say, this soft contrast look, which was lit that way, um, but making sure there's a black somewhere in the frame to anchor it slightly, and, and other times it got heavier. And although Rob uses various filtration for soft looks and, and, and various techniques, but it'll never look as good as if it's been naturally done. Um, and if you want to take it the other way and, and pull the shadows down, which we have on some of devs for a slightly darker look in certain scenes and crunchier look to give it a good base, if it's a very serious scene, we might want to emphasize that. That's easier to do. So yeah, his natural soft lighting, uh, soft silhouettes um, are just beautiful. You're not having to dig things out of shadows. I think for San Francisco, that quality of light, and the angle of light, um, was ex was extraordinary, and thank God you, we get that in HDR. You can see like 50 miles. I mean, there's shots we would just watch and just all kind of say, that's ridiculous. You should hold that for another 10 seconds. And he would, or he'd find another shot like that to use. Or they look CG because they're just extraordinary with a city that big in frame, like 10 miles away across the hills. And those shots, I could grade almost any way. At one point I was making those gold. Another time we went blue and at the time, you know, because they just had such extraordinary scope within the image. This is another thing we were talking about with the camera that you there's a place there's a place a shot wants to be both where it was shot and how far you can push it or move it in the camera and then where you really want it to be storytelling wise or visually and with this one you could go almost anywhere if something was red you could cool it down or green good tools in the base like with color temperature stuff but you could really offer up things that were different and in the end you might just come 20% from where it originally sat, or you might completely change it for a totally different feel, and it would still work. Shooting with the low, shooting with low light for Venice was, was again a bit of a revelation for us. It wasn't just about pushing an ISO uh, and, then, and then bringing everything, you know, bringing everything back down in the grade. Some extensive testing with this split ISO um, what we, into what we called night mode. Uh, we, you know, we'd base at 2,500 and then we'd shoot at 1250 and it, it, it just, it, it, for us, it was a sweet spot. Uh, so suddenly you're getting everything you want and need in terms of uh, image quality, detail, um, balance between the shadows and the highlights. And also the confidence to know that, you know, you can shoot in low light. This was again. It was a whole new, whole new thing for us. A whole, a whole new revelation, which was great, which was perfect. Because it meant that I mean, we got some beautiful, really beautiful aerials of San Francisco at night. So I was really pushing brightness into these night scenes and b being in high dynamic range, that was great. Nothing was getting clipped and we'd get these bright areas and also adding a kind of key and a bit of glow. And it was really quite interesting. So I showed Rob when he returned and he absolutely loved it. And then he said, well, can we try that boost you're doing on the day material? So we started doing that and the image wasn't breaking. And it was really interesting. And I think being, uh, there are sort of two worlds we have there is it's set in San Francisco and you've got day uh, flat interiors, but very bright lit through windows uh, and San Francisco itself, which is very, very bright. And then into the world of devs, which is an interior, it's darker, 
uh, there's gold around, but it's very much sort of lit in, in, in small areas. And so going very bright on certain things in dark really worked, really worked for the story. Uh, and obviously not doing that on the night interiors because it, you know, we just held those with practicals. And it's, I don't like to say pushed, but it's the most kind of HDR or using the greatest dynamic raid I've ever done. On devs, certainly, you know, some of the scenes, some of the shots, day exterior just look truly three dimensional to a level of brightness, not painful. We didn't want to go gimmicky on it, but that had extraordinary depth. And also in devs, because the entire ins inside of devs is covered with these 250 gold leaf panels with lights constantly playing across them. The detail of color in the highlights in high dynamic range is extraordinary. And we had to work very, very hard in standard dynamic range to get that kind of effect. I think there's also a sort of weight to it, you know, and, and Asa would tell you this, that, you know, you can, you've got so, you've got so far to go with it, as, is, as was the case with devs, you know, we, it was a hundred day shoot, and then we were in a lucky enough position to have an ongoing grading session, which, which spanned a couple of months, actually, and so I could go in two or three days a week, uh, work on a specific episode, then come back and revisit that and then go move forward and da 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 da. It was like we whenever we got to a point with the image, we were like, this is this is perf this is perfect. What if we went a bit further? You know, what if we just just that and, then, and we would push and push and push and Alex's thing is always like, let's push it till it breaks. Let's just keep pushing until it breaks and see what happens. And then in other words, we have to go through it out the other side to come back to where, to know that we're in the right place. Um, but often it, it would just keep going and it would never break. And it was, then it got to a point where like, you know, it, the, the, the the options are limit, limitless here, but we, we have to be, you know, if, they, if there's one criticism, it's like we have to kind of go, we don't want limitless options. We want to be able to say this is what we want and this is where we're going to land. Which is why we ended up grading with the HDR, because we just wanted to see, we wanted to see everything that was available to us, everything that, that the camera, that combination of camera and, and those uh, C series anamorphic lenses could give us and we saw everything you know and then sometimes we saw more than we we would ever we could ever expect we wanted every image to just be out, outrageous we wanted it to be like we wanted to hit the audience over the head with it because it was like we just wanted to do the best work we could possibly do and as you progress through the episodes one to eight, uh, it it doesn't stop getting uh, progressively. Uh, I can't. I, I don't really have the words to describe it, other than to say um, it's sort of a bit nuts, really. It it it's, it just you know it becomes this thing. I th I think for me, like I'm really really proud of it. Episode seven, for example, was I think like one of the best things I've ever done.